A prisoner serving 15 years for murder attempted to pull off an unbelievable escape from jail by wrapping himself in sheepskin. He was a real-life wolf in sheep's clothing. Jose Luis Calasaya Diaz attempted to escape from Chanchacoro, a maximum security prison in Bolivia, in February 2023 by wrapping himself in sheepskin and crawling through the grassland surrounding the jail. The inmate used his fleece coat to sneak past security and attempted to break through one of the prison's external walls on February 4th. Despite his sneaky attempts, security noticed Diaz, who is serving 15 years for murder, was not in his cell. Photos of his bizarre attempted escape show the prisoner crawling around on all fours in a field while wearing the fuzzy coat before he was taken back into custody. Diaz thought the cold weather would provide some cover during his escape, prison officials said. Authorities have ordered legal and disciplinary actions against Diaz since his attempted escape. This is the extraordinary moment a prisoner stripped off to squeeze through the food hatch of his cell in a bid to escape jail. Footage shows the slender inmate forcing himself through the tiny holes dark naked. The incident, which was caught on CCTV, is believed to have taken place in the town of Izerbash in the Republic of Dagestan. Rustam Shakrutinov, 25, has been identified as the escapee and dubbed Snake Man by local media in southwest Russia. The video begins with the lag already, with most of his torso sticking out through the small hatch. He can then be seen uncomfortably negotiating his behind and private regions through the hole before tumbling onto the floor, giving quite an eyeful to the security camera, then slips on his shoes and casually strolls down the corridor while pulling on his top. It is currently unknown if Russian cops have been able to reapprehend the flexible felon. Users on social media have compared the daring escape to an early episode of The X-Files, as well as a scene from Ace Ventura where Jim Carrey forces himself out of a mechanical rhino. A Wisconsin woman was caught on tape, breaking out of her handcuffs and escaping from a local police station, Authority said. 30-year-old Amber Gonzalez was arrested in September 2018 at the Beaumont Hotel for theft and possession of drug paraphernalia. Officers took Gonzalez to a holding cell in the Waukesha Police Department, where surveillance video shows her alone in the holding cell on her cell phone, allegedly trying to coordinate bail and a ride home. Video footage captures the 97-pound woman wriggling and pulling her hand through the cuffs in less than a minute, despite police saying that they placed the handcuffs on the tightest setting. The defendant stated in the complaint from the clerk of Circuit Court, Waukesha County, that she became anxious about going to jail and not seeing her children. Once she freed herself, Gonzalez proceeded to escape the holding cell and walk out of the building from an emergency exit. She further explained in the complaint that she took the keys from a door handle and used them to open the door and get outside. She then went to a gas station and met up with a truck driver, since identified as James W. Humbert, according to the complaint. The pair went back to the same hotel where she was initially arrested, and the truck driver then allegedly paid Gonzalez for sex. Humbert told police in the complaint that he had met Gonzalez at a nearby Wendy's location two weeks prior to the incident. He eventually admitted that he was going to the hotel to engage in prostitution with the defendant, a law enforcement official noted in the complaint. About an hour after her escape, police re-arrested her at the hotel on prostitution charges. This time, officers booked her at the Waukesha County Jail, where she was released a few days later on bail. Danilo Cavalcante, a 34-year-old convicted of first-degree murder in the 2021 killing of his ex-girlfriend, escaped from Chester County Prison on August 31, 2023, and was captured two weeks later. Cavalcante was sentenced to life in prison, but had not yet been transferred to a state prison at the time of his escape. Despite its name, Chester County Prison is technically a county jail. Surveillance video of the escape shows he placed his hands on one wall, and his feet on another, and crab walked up to the roof. He then ran across the roof, scaled another fence, and got through more razor wire. Neither the tower guard overlooking the prisoners, nor the person tasked with monitoring the facility's cameras, saw the escape as it happened. Since Cavalcante escaped encounters with the guards, the armed and dangerous man repeatedly raised alarms as he stole a vehicle, a weapon, and other items while on the run from authorities. He was spotted on multiple homes' doorbell cameras. After eluding a manhunt for nearly two weeks, 
the convicted murderer got captured. Authorities got an important clue to Cavalcanti's whereabouts when a burglar alarm at a home was tripped shortly after midnight Wednesday. A DEA aircraft using thermal imaging equipment was then able to guide a tactical team that closed in on Cavalcanti using the element of surprise. Earlier that year, another inmate escaped from the same facility using a similar tactic. Igor Bolt climbed onto the facility's roof and dropped down to a less secure area on May 19th. Bolt told police he was able to scale a wall in an exercise area by putting his legs against one wall and his arms on another until he was able to pull himself onto the roof. He was caught within minutes, less than a mile from the prison. Prison officials said they subsequently took steps to enhance security. We thought we took appropriate measures to prevent that with the razor wire, Chester County Prison Acting Warden Howard Holland said during a news conference. Again, the one thing we didn't take into account was a failure on the human element side. We only focused on the physical infrastructure and not necessarily the human element. In Garland County, a 34-year-old man named Derek Estelle looks to be on the phone, perhaps talking to a loved one. In reality, he's biding his time to make the escape. This wasn't a solo job either. He had conspired with other prisoners to distract the officers. Once the officers were on the other side of the room, he jumped across a counter and through a window. You can then see footage of him squeezing out, followed by an officer squeezing out after him. Other footage captures him outside making a run for it. A car awaited him, his ticket to freedom. They drove away with officers trying to stop the car from pulling away but the fact that the cops knew what the car looked like was a massive blow. Police later found the vehicle abandoned. Estelle was caught three weeks later in an abandoned home with his girlfriend, who is believed to be the driver of the vehicle he jumped into. At the prison, Estelle's mother and stepfather were also charged with assisting the escape. Mothers will do anything for their kids. A security camera captured footage of a jail inmate's apparent escape attempt from a holding room that ended with her falling through a ceiling and landing head first in a trash can. Jail security video shows Boomershine climbing up a holding room wall January 21st as other inmates watch and then moving out of sight. A few seconds later, parts of ceiling tiles fall to the floor. Boomershine's legs then appear and guards pull her down. She ends up head first in a trash can that then tips over. Boomershine was in jail on charges of kidnapping and robbing an 85-year-old Dayton area man last month, records show. She and a co-defendant broke into the man's home after meeting him at a casino, according to prosecutor Matt Heck. The pair took the man's gun, forced him to provide the code to his bank card, withdrew money from his account, placed him in the trunk of his car, and then abandoned the vehicle near a trash facility, the prosecutor's office said. The man escaped and was later found inside the trash facility. Any retro gamers hearing this will recall a solid snake sneaking through the air ventilation system. And this is exactly how these prisoners got out. This is what we can see on the CCTV footage from Lincoln County. Three inmates walked over to the corner and quickly climbed into the ventilation system. But they weren't just climbing in and hoping for the best. They had done it many times before. They were essentially climbing in through this ventilation system and going into the kitchen. This way, they could pop in and get a snack whenever they wanted to. Eventually, they found out how to break out of the kitchen. Then they decided on their plan to escape. Of the four inmates, three were captured within three days. On the fourth day, the final convict was captured and brought back. But the most shocking aspect of it all is that this wasn't their first escape attempt. Two of the convicts escaped three months later through the exact same route. Let's just say this prison doesn't easily learn its lessons. Our next escape happened in Copenhagen, Denmark. Instead of climbing through the walls or escaping through fancy tunnels, the prisoner just got one of his buddies to crash into the wall with a bulldozer and hope for the best. This bulldozer did its job and destroyed the wall. Footage can be seen of the bulldozer simply smashing into the wall with several prisoners making a break for it. There was also believed to be a football match at the time. Were they desperate to see the football game or desperate to blend into a massive crowd? It's difficult to tell, but this footage did not come from CCTV cameras. It came from a cameraman on the outside. This was in 1995, before high-fidelity camera phones. 
This is why it's rumored that this cameraman was in on the escape, or else he was just in the right place at the right time. One of the escapees is Brian Bo Larson, who is every Danish prison guard's worst nightmare. He escaped prison again in 2004 by hiding in a container that was transported out of the prison. In 2014, he used a hacksaw to saw the bars of his cell off and rope ladders to climb up to the roof and back down on the other side. He's one of the world's most notorious prison escapees, but maybe not the most famous on this list, as we'll see later. Rather than carrying out some Houdini-like stunt to escape, these prisoners used their own charm and charisma to break free in Texas. A female prison guard was sweet-talked into assisting with the prison break by three prisoners. She essentially did all the work for them. She shut off the alarms, unlocked the door, and gave a false prison headcount. This gave the men an 11-minute head start. The prisoners seemed to have gotten hold of other clothes as they can be seen all wearing white and simply opening the gate and strolling out of the prison. Meanwhile, the prison guard can be seen running her hands through her hair and stressing about the situation. The prison guard was arrested a day later. The silver-tongued devils were found after five days. No prison officers have been wooed by their charms since. Another crazy prison escape on this list comes from a Brazilian drug dealer named Clavino da Silva. The plan was as follows. Get his daughter to visit him in his cell. Dress up as his daughter. The small matter of his daughter still being left in the prison cell wasn't of that much concern to him, so he put on a black wig, glasses, a bra, and a t-shirt. He also put on a silicone mask. Da Silva was also nicknamed Shorty, so he was roughly the same height as his daughter, but the guards caught hold of this. In this footage, we can see them removing the glasses and the wig. The jig was up, and his career as a potential drug queen was up too. Police questioned whether his daughter was in on the escape too. There were also another eight people involved. It suggested that the wig, mask, bra, and t-shirt were all gradually snuck into his cell. Had he pulled this off, the guards at the station would need to get their eyes tested. This attempt was crazy, but unfortunately for Da Silva, unsuccessful. One of the greatest prison escape artists ever is El Chapo. In this footage, you can see him walking up and down his cell until suddenly he drops into the tunnel. His real name is Joaquin Guzman, and he's one of the world's most notorious criminals. He had built a secret underground tunnel beneath the shower, but El Chapo holds a little bit of leeway with the gods. He wasn't slowly chipping away like Andy Dufresne in the Shawshank Redemption. There was loud hammering, but the guards outside decided to ignore the noise. In the footage, you can see him pacing back and forth waiting for the right moment. Before he exits, you can see a mobile phone on his desk that had been smuggled in to organize the escape. When escaping, he turned the volume up on the television by his bed to drown out any sound. This tunnel went underground for a mile until it reached a property coincidentally and conveniently owned by El Chapo's wife, but the real work was done inside the tunnel. His drug cartel was used to building tunnels between the U.S. and Mexican borders to smuggle drugs. They simply built another extensive tunnel system to help free their leader. It had lighting, ventilation, and even a rail system. The rail had an adapted motorcycle on it, which was used to transport tools for the dig. El Chapo's breakout was in 2015, and he enjoyed two years of freedom until he was eventually caught again. He is now held in an infamous American prison. A 21-year-old man in the U.S. Mississippi was sentenced to 40 years in state prison for trying to escape from a correctional facility just months before his release. The unfortunate prison break means he could be in his 60s before he can walk free again. Sean Kendrick Huffman fled Central Mississippi Correctional Facility in August 2022, broke into a nearby home, and held three people at gunpoint for several hours. He then stole a car from one of the hostages and crashed it. Authorities who were searching for him found him hiding in a trash can at the Mississippi State Hospital in Whitfield, 3.2 kilometers from the prison, and was locked up again within hours. Notably, he was doing a seven-year sentence for aggravated assault and was expected to be released in December 2022. That means he was just four months away from his freedom. 
He pleaded guilty to two counts of kidnapping and a circuit court judge sentenced him to 40 years in state prison. Rankin County District Attorney Bubba Bramlett said Monday, it is unclear why he tried to escape just months before his release. Mississippi Department of Corrections Commissioner Burl Kane said that the Central Mississippi Correctional Facility would improve its siren system to prevent future escapes. The correctional facility's boss, Burl Kane, also apologized at the time of the incident after a siren to alert locals to an escaped convict failed to go off. Two inmates in a Virginia jail used primitively made tools to create a hole in the wall of their cell and escape, only to be found hours later at an IHOP restaurant nearby, a sheriff said. Authorities discovered the two men, ages 37 and 43, missing from their cell in the Newport News Jail Annex during a routine headcount Monday evening, according to a statement from the Newport News Sheriff's Office. A preliminary investigation found the men exploited a weakness in the jail's construction design and used tools made from a toothbrush and a metal object to access rebars between the walls, and then used the rebar to further their escape, the statement said. After escaping their cell, they scaled a containment wall around the jail. Authorities had asked for the public's help to find the men, and they were taken into custody again early Tuesday at an IHOP in Hampton, where other patrons called police. It reinforces what we always say. See something, say something, Sheriff Gabe Morgan said. The Sheriff's Office said it is investigating to help prevent further escapes. One man who lives in Hampton had been in custody on charges, including contempt of court and probation violations. Another, a Gloucester resident, was being held on charges, including credit card fraud, forgery, grand larceny, and probation violation. Charges related to the escape are pending, the Sheriff said. A drug trafficker wore his wife's clothes to escape from prison, but was caught after a policeman noticed he was walking funny. Ronaldo Silva, 39, shaved his arms and legs and then strode out the front gate in a blue dress, wig, high heels, and a dash of bright red lipstick. He was picked up just 30 minutes later after an officer on patrol noticed he was unsteady on his feet. Jail director Carlos Welber said Silva's wife brought the clothes in during her weekly visit and went home in her husband's Bermuda shorts. Welber said he left the prison shortly after her. He'd spent a long time preparing. Mr. Welber added the wife admitted giving the inmate clothes but said she did not know why he wanted them. Silva was only transferred to the jail in Pinedo, northeastern Brazil, after a previous armed escape effort. In 1966, an 18-year-old Margot Freshwater met a 38-year-old Memphis lawyer, and the two went on a multi-state crime spree resulting in three deaths. Although Freshwater did not commit the murders, she was sentenced to serve 99 years behind bars. 18 months into her sentence, Freshwater and another inmate scaled a wall, escaping from the Tennessee prison for women in Nashville. Freshwater seemed to vanish into thin air. She hopped a train and returned to her hometown in Ohio, changing her name to Tanya. She applied for a new social security number, and in 1984, her family had her declared legally dead. She birthed three children, married three times, and became a friend to many, a woman who worked hard to take care of her family. By the time authorities called up to Freshwater in 2002, she was known as Tanya McCorder, a grandmother in her 50s. Her family knew nothing of her criminal past or her real name. Authorities hauled Freshwater back to the Tennessee prison she escaped from 32 years earlier. Her family felt outraged at the police for disturbing their happy home, but maintained their love and loyalty to Tanya McCorder, the amazing woman they knew. In 2011, the lawyer who actually shot the three people during his and Freshwater's crime spree back in 1966 admitted that he acted alone in the incident. She was granted a new trial and released in November 2011. This video shows how three inmates broke out of a Southern California jail from the point of view of the inmates themselves. Using a contraband cell phone, the three men, Hussein Nayeri, Jonathan Tu, and Tian Duong, documented their escape from a maximum security wing of the Orange County Jail in January 2016. Duong turned himself in to authorities a week after the escape, and Tiu and Nayeri were caught in San Francisco, 400 miles away from the jail, eight days after the escape. 
The video, provided by an attorney connected to the case, shows one of the men lift a sawed-off bunk bed leg, revealing a metal screen already cut open. He then disappears into the vent, crawling through plumbing pipes inside the jail. An inmate even stops to give a thumbs up to the camera before finally reaching the jail roof. The video also shows the inmates in Northern California during their days on the run. A man who broke free from the Liberty County Jail in July 2023 was placed back into custody after a brief escape. His escape was short-lived after he injured his ankle while scaling a fence around the jail. In the process, he also lost his shorts and pants and was wearing only a jail-issued shirt when he was recaptured. The Liberty County Sheriff's Office informed the public about Sean Dale Jordan's escape from its detention facility, which is located at 2400 Beaumont Avenue in Liberty, Texas, on a Friday evening. The Sheriff's Office said Jordan was on the run for an hour and 40 minutes, adding that he was able to escape after squeezing his way through two doors. He then allegedly got over a razor wire fence where he lost his pants and bloodhounds picked up his scent. Officials said Jordan gave up and heard deputies in the area searching when he yelled out with his hands up and surrendered. He was originally booked on June 30th on counts of manufacturing and delivery of a controlled substance and unlawful possession of a firearm by a felon, but deputies said he's now facing escape charges. Is this the worst jailbreak attempt ever? A prisoner tried to escape jail by squeezing his body through a cell food hole. The escape attempt quickly ended in disaster when he got stuck between the bars of his cell door. Prison officers who filmed the man trying to escape from a jail in Russia appeared to find his plight amusing as they filmed him stuck. In the clip, the prison officer filming him says, Sonia, what are you doing here? Why did you crawl out of the cage? Did someone ask you to do this? A prisoner tried to escape from a Dutch penitentiary institution on December 24, 2023 by hiding in a wheelie bin. He didn't actually get out of the prison but employees failed to notice his absence during multiple roll calls, only noticing he was missing the following day. The prisoner apparently had the help of another inmate in hiding himself in the wheelie bin. The penitentiary is investigating how his absence went unnoticed during multiple cell rounds. Jack Shepard enjoyed near-celebrity status in 18th century London for his multiple prison escapes, though he apprenticed as a carpenter. In 1723, he decided that a life of crime was a more rewarding way to make a living. In 1724, he escaped from prison four times. Shepard escaped within three hours of his first arrest. He broke through the ceiling and lowered himself to the ground with a rope made from bedsheets. Three weeks later, he was arrested again. This time, he removed a bar from the window and performed the same bedsheet stunt. He was arrested a third time and sentenced to death. On the day of his execution, he loosened a bar from his window and escaped wearing women's clothing. After his final capture, Shepard was secured with 300 pounds of iron weights and placed under constant surveillance. He was executed on November 16, 1724. Alfred George Hines was arrested for a jewelry robbery in 1953 and was sentenced to serve 12 years behind bars at England's Nottingham prison. Hines, who protested his innocence, managed to escape the prison after sneaking through the locked doors and climbing over a 20-foot prison wall. He was arrested again six months later. Hines filed a lawsuit claiming that the arrest was illegal and was granted a trial. At the courthouse, Hines had an accomplice smuggle in a padlock and install screw eyes into one of the washroom stalls. When two guards escorted Heinz to the washroom and removed his handcuffs, Heinz pushed the guards into the stall and locked them inside. He was captured at the airport five hours later and was sent to Chelmsford Prison. Within 12 months, Heinz escaped from Chelmsford. He was captured again two years later and served the remainder of his sentence. Her Majesty's Prison Maze was considered to be one of the most escape-proof prisons in all of Europe. Each of the prison blocks were surrounded by 15-foot fences, 18-foot concrete walls, and solid steel gates that opened electronically. This Northern Ireland prison housed many Irish Republican Army prisoners that had been convicted of violent offenses. On September 25, 1983, 38 IRA prisoners escaped from the Maze prison. 
Shortly after 2.30 p.m., the prisoners took control of their H-block using guns that had been smuggled into the prison. At 3.25, a truck bringing food supplies was overpowered, the driver's foot was tied to the clutch, and the driver was forced to drive out of the prison. 19 of the escapees were caught within several days of the escape. While some of the escapees were eventually found and extradited, those remaining have been given amnesties due to the politics in Northern Ireland. In 1997, Pascal Payette participated in the robbery of a Banc de France armored vehicle, which resulted in the death of one of the guards. On October 12, 2001, he escaped from a prison on a hijacked helicopter. In 2003, he orchestrated the escape of three of his fellow accomplices with the help of another hijacked helicopter. He was eventually caught and sentenced to 30 years in prison for the 1997 murder, seven years for the 2003 escape, and another six years for his own escape in 2001. Payette became one of the most closely watched prisoners in France and was transferred to different prisons every few months. Despite these precautions, on July 14, 2007, four masked men hijacked another helicopter and facilitated the escape of Payette from a prison in Grasse. Two months later, he was captured again in Mataro, Spain. His current whereabouts are a well-kept secret. June 6, 2015, Richard Matt, 48, and David Sweat, 34, escaped from the Clinton Correctional Facility in Dannemora, New York. Joyce Mitchell, a 51-year-old prison tailor shop worker, developed sexual relationships with both inmates, provided them with smuggled tools, asked them to kill her husband, and planned to flee with the violent pair to Mexico. Richard Matt and David Sweat used power tools to cut holes in the back of their adjacent cells, which led to a six-story high catwalk that provided access to various pipes and tunnels. After cutting into a two-foot wide pipe, they traveled 400 feet inside the pipe and escaped through a manhole in the town of Danamora. Joyce Mitchell, who had planned to rendezvous with the pair and provide a getaway vehicle, was nowhere to be found. Police killed Matt on June 26, and Sweat was captured two days later. The mass escape of 76 Allied airmen from a Nazi POW camp in March 1944 remains one of history's most famous prison breaks. Although the German Luftwaffe designed the Stalag Luft III camp to be escape-proof, the audacious, real-life prison break immortalized in the 1963 movie The Great Escape proved otherwise. When the Nazis built the maximum security camp 100 miles southeast of Berlin to house Allied aviators captured in World War II, many of whom had made previous escapes, they took elaborate measures to prevent tunneling, such as raising prisoners' huts off the ground and burying microphones nine feet underground along the camp's perimeter fencing. The Nazis, however, didn't account for the daring and ingenuity of the British. For the aviators, the penalty for being caught trying to escape, generally 10 days in solitary confinement under the rules of the Geneva Convention, was worth the risk. The secret operation was led and organized by Roger Bushell, a Royal Air Force pilot. In the spring of 1943, Bushell and over 600 prisoners of war began building three tunnels with the code names of Tom, Dick, and Harry. Working in claustrophobic conditions, diggers stripped to their long johns or took off all their clothes so that the bright golden sand wouldn't stain them and raised the suspicions of the German guards. The captives excavated at least 100 tons of sand, which they stuffed into concealed socks and discreetly sprinkled and raked into the soil of the small gardens tended by the prisoners. The Nazis eventually discovered the tunnel Tom, and while the Nazis celebrated their discovery, however, they were unaware that work on the two other underground passages continued. Around 10.30 p.m. on the frigid, moonless night of March 24, 1944, British bomber pilot Johnny Bull slowly traversed the tunnel more than 30 feet below the oblivious Nazi guards and peeked his head out of the snowy ground beyond the camp's fence. Around 5 a.m., a German soldier on patrol nearly fell into the exit shaft and discovered the tunnel. The Nazis discovered that 76 prisoners had broken out. The Nazis mobilized a massive manhunt. Within two weeks, the Germans had recaptured 73 of the escapees. Only three men successfully fled to safety. Two Norwegians who stowed away on a freighter to Sweden and a Dutchman who made it to Gibraltar by rail and foot. A furious Adolf Hitler personally ordered the execution of 50 of the escapees as a warning to the other prisoners. 
In late 2010, the Mujahideen began work on a 1,000-foot tunnel in the city of Kandahar with the hopes of freeing hundreds of Taliban insurgents. The tunnel, which took five months to dig, bypassed government buildings, watchtowers, barriers topped with razor wire, and went through the concrete floor of an Afghan prison. On April 25, 2011, 480 prisoners crawled to freedom in less than 30 minutes. The Taliban had acquired keys prior to the escape, which were used to open the cells of their friends. On the other side of the tunnel, minibuses were waiting to drive the hundreds of escapees away from the heavily guarded area. It's likely that some of the prison guards were either bribed or politically motivated to facilitate the escape. The only thing more remarkable than constructing a 1,000-foot tunnel lined with a strong rubber ventilation tube is that nobody managed to stop it from happening. Choi Gapbak is a 53-year-old man, a criminal with over 20 years behind bars, and a yoga expert. Choi first escaped custody 25 years ago by slipping through the bars of a bus that was carrying prisoners to jail. He was captured two days later. Choi decided to practice yoga during most of his two decades in and out of jail. On September 17, 2012, he was ready to pull off an even more remarkable escape. When the guards fell asleep, he covered his pillows with a blanket, making it appear that he was still in bed, and applied skin ointment over his torso. He then squeezed through the tiny food slot at the bottom of his cell and escaped the prison. He was apprehended six days later and placed in a cell with an even tinier food slot. It seemed that yoga, for some, isn't just a popular way to exercise. During World War II, the Nazis would execute 10 prisoners for every person who attempted to escape their extermination camps. By 1943, rumors had begun to circulate that the Nazis were intending to close the camps and exterminate all of their prisoners. Leon Feldhendler and Alexander Pachersky, prisoners at Sobibor, decided that being killed while trying to escape was better than being murdered in a gas chamber. The plan was to have every prisoner attack at once, kill the SS officers, and hope that the Ukrainian guards would retreat. On October 14, 1943, Nine SS officers and two guards were isolated and killed. Unfortunately, a Ukrainian guard found one of the dead Germans and sounded the alarm. Around half of the 400 prisoners attempting to flee were shot and killed. The Germans then exterminated the remaining 300 prisoners and closed the camp. Only 58 of the escapees survived the war. Frank Abagnale is the notorious con man portrayed by Leonardo DiCaprio in the film Catch Me If You Can. Abagnale committed bank fraud and successfully impersonated pilots, lawyers, and doctors as a means of avoiding detection and inevitable imprisonment. In 1969, an Air France flight attendant recognized him and informed the police. He spent six months each in French and Swedish prisons before being extradited to America. On arrival at the JFK airport, Abagnale escaped the plane and fled to Canada, but he was quickly apprehended. In 1971, Abagnale escaped a federal prison in Atlanta, Georgia. One of Abagnale's friends supplied him with a fake prison inspector card and a forged FBI business card. He then convinced the guards that he was an undercover prison inspector who desperately needed to contact the FBI. Abagnale called his friend, walked out of the prison, got into a car, and drove away. Michael Valjour was a man who had things to do. Not nice things, maybe but certainly things which were impeded by the fact that in 1985 he was convicted of bank robbery and attempted murder and sentenced to 18 years in prison. He wasn't overly concerned with that, though. Before he was even convicted, he'd already been planning his escape. Every good prison break needs an outside associate, and Vajur had one ready and waiting, his wife Nadine. As soon as Vajur was arrested, she began taking classes to obtain her license as a helicopter pilot. With that in hand, in the months leading up to the event, she became a regular customer of a helicopter rental company in southern Paris. Inside the walls of the formidable Prison de la Santé, Michael Vajour had befriended a man named Pierre Hernandez, who was awaiting trial on armed robbery charges. The two of them took every opportunity to examine the prison grounds, looking for the right place for a helicopter to land. After months of secretive scouting, the problem became clear. There was no place that was going to be big enough to set one down and allow it to take off again. The plan was forced to undergo a few changes. At approximately 10.30 a.m. on May 26, 1986, 
a helicopter flew low over central Paris. Nadine Vajour ignored a hail of radio warnings and brought the machine to a hovering stop over the roof of one of the prison buildings. The warnings over the guards' radios of a helicopter on the roof were eclipsed by a far more intense situation developing inside the walls, and eventually Vajour and Hernandez emerged from an access door and jogged unchallenged across the roof. While a helicopter inexplicably hovered over the prison, the guards were far more focused on another report coming over the radio. Two inmates had apparently managed to smuggle in a number of grenades and were now threatening to detonate them if they were approached. The grenades were, it was later revealed, nectarines from the prison cafeteria which were painted green. Bajur and Hernandez made a point to pause frequently as they made their way to the roof, menacingly waving their fistfuls of fruit at the pursuing officers. With the threat of explosives from the two men and the presumed threat of more explosives on board the waiting helicopter, not a single shot was fired. Valjour scrambled up a line and grabbed the runner, eventually managing to swing himself inside. Hernandez, for reasons unknown, changed his mind at the last moment and quietly surrendered to the authorities. The helicopter disappeared from view and the Valjours were away. They remained at large for more than four months, even managing to pick up their two daughters from under the noses of a police surveillance unit. The breakout made headlines around the world as French police presumably were forced to award Vajour some sort of gold star in absentia for successfully completing the fifth prison escape of his career. In 2012, perhaps history's most comical prison escape took place. The guys doing the escaping had done everything right, at the start at least. With painstaking perseverance, they dug a tunnel at a prison in Ceres in Brazil. This had taken the men quite some time, but then one day, they were finally ready to make their move. One of the guys was Rafael Valadeo, who weighed around 224 pounds at the time of the escape. It should be noted he wasn't exactly tall. He was the second to go through, with a much smaller man going first. Behind him were some other guys. The problem was, due to Valadeo's size, he got stuck, which left the guys behind him also stuck. When prison officers arrived on the scene, they didn't know whether to be serious or fall down laughing. Valadeo had apparently broken a rib trying to fit through the hole, and this, it seems, was amusing to the officers. One of the firefighters who was tasked with extracting him told the media. The other prisoners tried to push him, but he stayed stuck in the wall. He started screaming in pain, and that was when the prison guards were alerted. A local cop explained. He seemed to have underestimated the size of his stomach. It seems that the smaller guy actually got away or at least that's what the report said at the time. Now for some pure, unadulterated dumb. In 2013, an inmate at Hamilton County Jail in Tennessee, USA, cooked up a plan to escape. It was a simple plan to say the least. That was to take another prisoner's ID, a prisoner that was about to be released. So, when that man's name was called, he would simply pass himself off as the other prisoner and walk out. Simple. The guy doing the escaping was named Kenneth Burnham, a white male standing about 5 feet 7 inches. The guy whose ID he'd borrowed was named Glenn Taylor. Using this other ID and getting as far as claiming the other man's belonging, Burnham was almost out the door when a prison officer noticed something didn't look quite right. That was the fact that Burnham didn't look anything like the person whose ID he was carrying. Taylor was, in fact, an African-American male, and his height was closer to 5 feet 10 inches. When officers asked Burnham why he thought he could pass himself off as someone with vastly different skin color, his reply was that he was desperate to get out and that he was being dumb. We can't disagree with that. In 2016, the media reported that a prisoner in Brazil thought about replicating his own version of the escape in the movie The Shawshank Redemption. The prisoner, who was locked up in a Brazilian jail, had enough of being inside, and so like many before him, decided he would try and break free. But in a high-security prison, there are few escape options available, with concrete walls and metal bars designed specifically to keep criminals from getting loose. We don't know his name, but thanks to a video that appeared online, we know his method of escape. He had believed that if he took out the toilet bowl in his cell, he'd be able to escape through the sewer pipes. Slithering headfirst into the sewage tunnel under the toilet, the prisoner appears to have some success getting to the first bend in the pipes 
before he gets into difficulty. After desperately trying to wriggle himself to freedom, the man finally admits defeat and has to accept help from two other men on dry land. As they grip onto his extremely skinny legs, the men struggle to pull the man back out of the tunnel and into the toilet. Finally, as the man emerges from the toilet bowl, he stands on two feet again, but faces a pretty messy cleanup operation. Completely coated with human excrement, the man can then be seen standing in his cell, reeling from his ordeal. While few details are known about the escape attempt, some reports have suggested it was in the Sao Paulo region of Brazil. As you might have seen in the movies, if you are going to dig an escape tunnel, one of the things you'll need to do is ventilate the place, or you might find yourself struggling to breathe. That's what happened in 2018 to a 25-year-old Brazilian man named Judson Cana Evangelista at Monte Cristo Penitentiary in northern Brazil. This guy did everything right at the start, spending months digging a tunnel during the nights and covering the entrance to the hole during the day. He managed to dig an impressive tunnel that was 230 feet long and reached all the way to the outside. It seems one night he had been digging, but was struggling to breathe, so he scurried as fast as he could back to his cell. He died anyway from an acute lack of oxygen. Shocked officers discovered a hole which began underneath the toilet in Evangelista's cell in Wing 7 of the Monte Cristo Penitentiary, the largest prison in Brazil's northernmost state of Roraima. The dirt tunnel continued for 230 feet underneath the prison and had already passed under its heavily fortified outer walls and electric fences, according to prison authorities. The tunnel is believed to have taken months to excavate and was reportedly just a few meters away from reaching the surface in the surrounding forest outside. Officers found several bags of dirt and an electric cable which ran the length of the tunnel with a light bulb on the end. The State Justice Department, Sehuk, which is in charge of the prison, said 150 policemen took seven hours to locate the tunnel after prison officers were alerted to its existence following Evangelista's death. It is believed the prisoner was planning to charge other inmates to use the tunnel in a mass escape bed. The tunnel has now been filled with concrete, a spokesman said. In January 2018, the Monte Cristo jail made headlines after a bloody rebellion broke out, during which more than 30 prisoners were killed. At the time, the prison, which had a capacity of 750 inmates, was housing more than 1,400. In Hammond, Indiana, in 1970, married mother of five, Linda Darby, fatally shot her husband in the abdomen and then set their home on fire. Police took her into custody on murder charges a short time later with mounds of evidence supporting her guilt. Unsurprisingly, a jury convicted Linda of first-degree murder, sentencing her to life in prison with parole eligibility after 15 years. In 1972, two and a half years after the murder and a year following her conviction, Linda escaped from the Indiana women's prison by climbing the 10-foot wall as she returned from the recreational area. Guards noticed her absence during headcount later that evening. Linda maintained her freedom for the next 35 years, apprehended in 2007 after a fugitive apprehension detective reopened her case. Pulaski, Tennessee resident Linda McElroy had lived in the small town with her husband and kids for over 30 years when Indiana police called and told them they believed she was an escaped convict. At 64 years old, Linda was a mother and grandmother, well-liked in the community. No one ever suspected she could hurt anyone, much less take a life. But when police knocked on her door holding a photo of Linda Darby and asked if she knew the woman, McElroy confessed that she was the woman they wanted. Darby maintained her innocence in the murder of her first husband, although she did tell her husband and children the story of her criminal past after her recapture. Police took Darby into custody. She remains incarcerated at the Rockville Correctional Facility. George Savas is perhaps the highest profile inmate to escape from a New South Wales jail in the past 20 years. Savas was jailed for 25 years in March 1990 for conspiring to import 80 kilograms of heroin to Sydney. Cashed up and with only one thing he desperately wanted, he appears to have immediately begun planning how he could cut short his term. In mid-1996, Savas was in Goulburn, having been shifted from Maitland when an escape plot was discovered the previous year. On July 6th, in the visitor's area, he donned a false beard, mustache, and wig, and walked out wearing civilian clothes. 
Eight months later, at 8.23 p.m. on March 20th, 1997, the Triple O Emergency Line received this call. George Savas is at the Suntory restaurant behind the Hoyt Cinema Complex in Kent Street. He is a wanted man. Savas was arrested eating beef fillets and sipping red wine. He had a gram of cocaine in his pocket and was dining with a pair of good shorts. Two months after his recapture, prison authorities revealed a plot hatched by Savas and the backpacker killer, Ivan Millet, to go over the wall of the maximum security Maitland Jail. The next day, Savas was found dead, hanging from a bedsheet in his cell. The prison was the notorious penitentiary at Port Arthur in Tasmania. This place started off as a penal colony where Brits who had acted badly ended up if, indeed, they survived the long journey across the ocean. It was also for the worst of the worst, those who had committed an offense even after they arrived in Australia. With that in mind, you can imagine that this place was no walk in the park. The authorities said it was impossible to escape from, and if someone tried, you can bet they'd suffer some serious physical and mental torture. It was a horror prison and that's why it has been compared to Alcatraz in the U.S. This brings us to a Scotsman named George Billy Hunt. He was transported to Australia and ended up at Port Arthur for the offense of stealing a handkerchief. If you think that's bad, the Edinburgh News in 2018 wrote, Other crimes, variously, were feloniously, willfully, and diabolically interfering with a dog, having lollipops in his possession. We don't know much more about Billy Hunt, but we do know that he attempted to escape the only way possible, which was through a mass of land nicknamed the Neck. To do that, he needed a disguise since the place was crawling with armed guards and vicious dogs. So Hunt killed a kangaroo and got inside the skin. He then hopped out of the prison and into the Neck. That's pretty clever, but let's just say he hadn't thought much about what would happen next. It seems the guards saw this kangaroo, and thinking it was a real living animal, they got their guns ready to shoot it. Hunt saw this and got out of the suit and put his hands up. A report stated, Hunt was dressed as a kangaroo and was attempting to hop to freedom, only to be shot at by rationed soldiers who had grown a hearty kangaroo stews. Hunt was charged with absconding and given 150 lashes of the whip. The moral of the story is if you're going to escape inside a dead animal, make sure it's one that humans don't hunt and eat. Walking down the corridors of Abashiri Prison Museum in Hokkaido, a life-size mannequin suddenly grabs your attention overhead. It's of a man wearing only white underwear attempting to escape. The figure represents Yoshi Shiratori, a prisoner no jail could hold. Between 1936 and 1947, the man known as the Harry Houdini of Japan escaped from four different cells. Shiratori was born in Amori Prefecture on July 31, 1907. Determined to pay off his father's debts, Shiratori got a job on a Russian ship catching crabs when he was 18. A few years later, he tied the knot and had a child, but was soon in financial trouble. Shiratori turned to gambling and stealing to raise funds and quickly became addicted. On April 3, 1933, he was part of a group of thieves that robbed a merchandise dealer's storehouse in Higashitsugaru. The adopted son of the owner was then stabbed to death after chasing two of the perpetrators out of the building. Shiratori reportedly handed himself in two years later when one of his acquaintances was arrested. Though he denied the murder charge, the police allegedly beat and tortured him to get him to confess. Transferred to Amori Prison, Shiratori often complained about the abhorrent conditions and the inhumane way he was treated by the guards. They responded to his complaints by punishing him even more. As the abuse continued, he studied their movements. In the morning, there was always a 15-minute gap in the patrol time. This was his short window of opportunity to get out of there. He decided to make his move in June 1936. Using a metal wire that had been wrapped around a bucket used for bathing, he picked his cell lock and escaped through a cracked skylight. Passing guards assumed he was still sleeping as he'd placed floorboards inside his futon. While Shiratori was highly skilled at escaping, he wasn't so proficient at evading capture. Caught stealing supplies from a hospital, he was rearrested just three days after the jailbreak. Handed a life sentence, he was eventually transferred to Akita Prison. Here he was treated even worse than before and started plotting his second escape. It wouldn't be easy though, as he was handcuffed at all times and placed in a cell specially designed to deter escape artists with high ceilings and a small skylight. Taking up the challenge, 
Cheritori regularly got out of his handcuffs and scaled the smooth copper wall to pry away at the rotting wood framing of the skylight. He then waited for a stormy night to go out of the window so his footsteps wouldn't be heard on the roof. This time, it was three months before Shiratori was back inside. He made the mistake of visiting the house of guard Kobayashi, the one officer who'd been nice to him in the slammer, to ask for help in a case against injustice in the Japanese prison system. Kobayashi, though, called the police, and Shiratori was sent to Hokkaido's notorious Abashiri prison, a place no inmate had ever escaped from. Exposed to the extreme cold while being forced to wear summer garments, he was placed in specially made hand and leg cuffs. Every morning, he spat miso soup on the cuffs and the frames of the narrow food slide on his cell door. The salt content oxidized the screws, leading to corrosion. Shiratori saw his chance to escape during the wartime blackout on August 26, 1944. Remarkably, he dislocated his shoulders to squeeze out of the tiny food slot. Following the most audacious of prison breaks, Shiratori headed to the snowy mountains, staying in an abandoned mine. After two years living off nuts, berries, and wildlife, he headed to a nearby village and learned of Japan's surrender. He then stole some tomatoes, which led to an altercation with a farmer, who he ended up killing. Shiratori claimed it was self-defense, but was this time sentenced to death. At Sapporo Prison, he had six guards surveilling him, with very high walls and windows smaller than his face. They didn't feel the need for handcuffs. However, as they focused too much on potential ceiling escapes, they forgot about the floor. Shiratori also tricked them by regularly looking up. As they slept, he used miso soup bowls to dig a tunnel, keeping the dirt in a small pocket under the floorboards. Unbelievably, he'd done it again. Shiratori was free for around a year when he was offered a cigarette by a police officer in a park. As this was seen as a luxury item in Japan, he was moved by the gesture. It was at that point that he decided to confess to being an escaped convict and was rearrested. The Sapporo High Court, though, revoked his death sentence, ruling the killing of the farmer was self-defense. Shiratori was sentenced to 20 years and served 14 due to good behavior. Treated fairly, there was no desire to escape. His request to be imprisoned in Tokyo's Fuku Prison was also granted. After being paroled in 1961, he did a variety of jobs and was reunited with his daughter. The ex-convict saw out his final days in Aomori before dying of a heart attack in 1979. He was 71. Carlos Garcia, a convicted killer, attempted to escape from a southeast New Mexico jail in 2012 by breaking a window bar with a razor blade and a popsicle stick, but changed his mind once he got outside. Police said Garcia, 31, told them it took about five months to break the bar on his cell window at the Leah County Correctional Facility in Hobbs, where more than 1,200 inmates are housed. He also used plastic, newspaper, and more popsicle sticks to fashion a fake window to make it look like the real window was still there. In the 14 years that I've been here, we've never had an incident like that here, said Officer Mike Stone of the Hobbs Police Department. A guard found Garcia outside on an early summer morning. He initially claimed he didn't know how he got there. Officer Stone said that Garcia admitted that sometimes he does crazy things, and he kind of acted like he didn't know what he had done. Not long after Garcia confessed he was trying to escape, Garcia later admitted that he broke the six-foot-by-one-foot window in his cell along with the metal bar that went across it. The tools that he said he used was a razor blade on the end of a popsicle stick, and he had worked at it for a while. Police said Garcia then squeezed through the small opening of the window, using bed sheets to propel himself down two stories. But once he was out, Garcia said he had second thoughts and climbed back in. Garcia was moved to a maximum security penitentiary later that day in Santa Fe for public safety concerns, Department of Corrections officials said. He was convicted of murder in 2005 for killing two young men in 2000. Court records show he was sentenced in 2005 to two consecutive life sentences, followed by 55 years for charges including murder, armed robbery, kidnapping, and arson. Garcia claimed he could have made it all the way out if he really wanted to but police said that's highly unlikely given the additional levels of security he still needed to go through. In January 2009, inmates Regan Reddy, 20, and Tiranara White, 21, who had been booked separately for different crimes on New Zealand's North Island and were handcuffed together for security at Hastings District Court, 
dashed out of the building and ran for their freedom. You might have thought that having evaded the courthouse guards and made it out of the building, the hard part would be over. However, two New Zealand prisoners had not reckoned on a lone lamppost. As Regan Reddy, 20, and Tiranara White, 21, sprinted to freedom, they managed to run on opposite sides of the post, promptly crashing into each other and falling to the floor. The duo made their break earlier this week as they were being taken from their cell to a courthouse in Hastings. They fell over and were sprayed with pepper spray, but they got up and ran out of the court onto the street across the road to a car park, police spokesman Dave Grieg told the Associated Press. That's where they met the pole. It was all over, Rover. Reddy, who had just been given a sentence of more than two years for assault, pleaded guilty to escaping from custody and had a month added to his sentence. White, who was in custody for allegedly stealing a car and violating parole, did not enter a plea and is awaiting a psychiatric evaluation. The whole escapade was caught on CCTV and has been released to the public. New Zealand's TV1 News labeled the video one of the worst escape attempts ever seen. It was a desperate bid for freedom that, perhaps with the benefit of hindsight, was always going to be described as rubbish. Two inmates tried to escape from a Brazilian prison by disguising themselves as bags of garbage to be put out by prison guards. Sidney de Cruz, 24, and Carlos Pereira, 18, hoped to be picked up and thrown outside by staff at the Delegacia de Fertos jail in Curitiba, southern Brazil. But a prison guard foiled the plot after noticing that the plastic bags were shaking, according to Brazil's Terra website. The lag's bid for freedom began after lunch, when leftover food and plastic plates were collected in rubbish sacks. The two men, jailed for car theft, climbed into the plastic sacks and put themselves next to the other bags lined up in a corridor for collection. Prison guard Cleverson Monero told Brazil's record TV station, I was walking past the sacks of rubbish and I noticed something moving. At first I thought there was a rat, but on closer inspection I could see it was two inmates disguised as bags. Police Chief Gerson Alves Mercado said, I don't know how they expected someone to pick them up and carry them away. These are grown men and the bags are made of thin plastic.